Okay. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good day, everybody. Uh, my name is Ward Matthews, and I'd like to, first of all, thank you for joining, you, uh, joining the, uh, the webinar today, as well as welcome you to uh, the second in the uh, Thirsty Thursday DevOps series for this year. It's called Flexing Your DevOps Muscle, Making a Good Pipeline Great. Um, you know, before we, uh, um, you know, more fully introduce our presenters, Tony Anther, the DevOps architect and evangelist, and Terry Capriotti, one of our principal technical account managers, would like to cover off on just a few housekeeping items, if you will. Uh, first of all, as you probably already noticed, the, uh, the webinar is being recorded, so be aware of that. That will also be uh, sent to you uh, uh, after the session today. Also, everyone did enter the meeting muted, but uh, we do inc uh, encourage you to ask questions. Uh, you should see a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, again, please uh, enter any questions or comments there uh, in the Q&A uh, window as opposed to the chat window. And then when you leave, uh, uh, you should receive a, a pop-up of, of a very brief survey. Uh, it's only four questions. We uh, really uh, would like you to complete that if possible. We take those very seriously and it's uh, very helpful in us. And <laughs> further shaping the, uh, the series to provide the content that uh, you're looking for and what's more meaningful to you. All right, Terry, we move on to our legal notice. This is our standard legal notice and it's really just specific to uh, product capabilities and product roadmap uh, uh, discussions. Although specific content about product capabilities and development plans are not a part of the presentation today, they may come up in some of the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So for that re reason, this legal notice is here. Um, you know, please uh, consider any uh, conversations around product capability or future product development um, uh, confidential. And then just a couple of comments about the Thirsty Thursday sessions. Uh, many of you may uh, uh, be aware or familiar with the, uh, the CompuWare AC monthly webinars, and this is uh, very similar to those. Uh, uh, we'll have a monthly cadence as before, and uh, like the uh, former series, they will also have a, a theme for the entire year. We do these on a monthly basis and uh, schedule those uh, a year in advance. So this year's theme is, guess what, DevOps. The emphasis of the series is to assist clients improve quality, velocity, and efficiency at all phases of the development life cycle, uh, as well as infinity loop, whether that's on the operations side or on the development side. Uh, another key focus of this uh, year's series is to not only include um, the, the BMC CompuWare products, what you may be familiar from uh, the former CompuWare organization, but also uh, the BMC uh, products as well. So with that, just kind of as a ground groundwork, I'd like to transition to our presenters. And Tony, you mind introducing yourself, leading us off here? Not at all, not at all. Thank you, Ward. So hi, my name is uh, Tony Anter, or Anthony Anter. Uh, I'm a DevOps architect and evangelist here at BMC. And my partner in crime this morning for Thirsty Thursdays is Terry Capriotti, a principal technical account manager. Terry, why don't Thank you, you go ahead and say hello? Yes, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, Terry Capriotti, uh, a technical account manager. I have been with BMC um, via CompuWare since 2008. Um, prior to that, I worked in DevOps and Ops both, and automation would have been near and dear to my heart um, 10 years ago. So I, I really embrace these concepts and these theory um, tech topics. Um, what are we going to cover today? Um, first, what is a pipeline? Um, some of the common components, how to go from good to great, and then next steps. So what is a pipeline? In last month's sessions, Relax is just uh, DevOps. Mark and Ward um, gave some high level introductions about tool chains and pipelines and you know, other DevOps vernacular. In today's session, um, Tony's gonna go a little deeper. He's gonna dive a little deeper specifically into pipelines. And yes, you're gonna hear that word many times today and almost have a bingo chart for you. Um, but the first step in building a pipeline is to know what tools you have to work with. So, so Tony, um, you know, let's talk about tool chains. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Terry. So last week with Ward and Mark, they introduced this DevOps tool chain. And this is almost the whole universe of what you can use 
for DevOps with uh, the BMC CompuWare solutions, as well as a, as a host of other tools that plug into this. And this, this, this tool chain is, is fantastic. And I think it's a great illustration of what we call our open borders policy, which with BMC CompuWare and with all the tools at BMC, we have the idea that it should, everything should plug and play together. Because there's not one solution, one way, one thing, uh, one methodology that will cover your DevOps needs as, a, as an organization, they have, we have this idea of open borders so that you can bring in some, some third-party tooling, some uh, pre-built tooling, uh, plug that into the BMC CompuWare solutions and put this whole tool chain together. But when we talk about the tool chain, then you also have to, if you want to take it one level below that, you have to then talk about the pipeline. So what is that pipeline? What, what is that DevOps pipeline and how does it interplay? So as you can see, the important part of this, this diagram is the, interop, is the interactions. The amount of tools that are in here that can fluctuate that's flexible and, and and this and by by no means is this the whole universe of everything that you can do and everything that you can plug in so it's this interaction between all the various tools that make this make this graphic pop but when we go that level deeper what is a pipeline what what makes up a pipeline if you can go to the next slide terry so really quick, the, the, the Webster's definition, for lack of a better term, of a tool chain is a connecting group of automation tools. And I think we saw that in the previous slide. It's that interaction or that connected group of tools that make up your tool chain. A pipeline, though, is a specific flow of tools from that tool chain, from your, from your tool chain. So it's, it's that flow of, I'm going to go from A to B to C to D to E to F, and how they interoperate, that's your pipeline. And there can be one to N pipelines within a tool chain. So within that tool chain, depending on your technology stack, what you're trying to do, uh, what the situation is, what the business rule is, <clears throat> you can have different pipelines for different scenarios. So what you're seeing here is a graphic of, of that pipeline and how you go from A to Z, how you go down the chain using different tools and how each one of those tools interoperate together. If you go ahead and go to the next slide, Terry. Tony, before, you, before we advance, I just have a, a quick question and, and comment. Um, you know, you talked about tool chain, which is all the tools in your your toolbox and then the pipeline is how I put those tools together. But how do I know what tools I have to use or what will work the best? I think that's dependent on what you're trying to accomplish. Right, Terry? It, it depends. So there isn't like a right or wrong answer to these are the five tools you should definitely use. What you need to do is you need to set that pipeline up sort of an MVP. And it's, it's depending on your business case, your technology stack, your organization, your process, what tools you have available in your tool chain, that will determine what goes into your pipeline, right? So it, it's what will work best for you, what will work best for your organization, for your department, for your team, for what you're trying to accomplish. And that's where, the, that's where also this concept of multiple pipelines in your tool chain come in. The tool, the pipeline that you'll use for, let's say, deploying mobile code will be different than the pipeline that you'll use for deploying uh, mainframe code will be different than the pipeline that you use for deploying to the cloud. That there, most of it will be the same, but there'll be some subtle differences and the, the, the specifics of each task as you go down your pipeline will also be a little bit different. And I can imagine then you could have even multiple pipelines within a stage. And, I, and what comes to mind is break fix within development, right? You know, you have yeah. your standard and then you'd have your break fix. So, you know, now that we understand the, the, I, I went back a slide, I apologize there. That's okay. Uh, now, yeah. Now that we understand them, you know, the concept of tool chain and pipeline, um, you know, the next thing is understanding what are some common components within a pipeline. So that's the environment. So, 
Um, can, can you give me a little bit more on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead. And the first thing I want to talk about is the code. So this is the sort of the beginning of the pipeline. This is where the engineer between this and build the next one is this is where the the engineer is going to spend probably the majority of his time. So as part of this pipeline, you're going to have your your development environments, whether you're using uh, Topaz or you're recording tests for Topaz in Topaz for total test or you're uh, analyzing your code uh, for with Topaz for program analysis, or you're, you're using Visual Studio. And that's where you're doing all of your, uh, that's where you're doing all of your work is within the Visual Studio, or, or you know, you're scanning your code, you're doing it, that it's that local development environment is where the engineer is going to spend the majority of his time. And that's where he's going to live. So when you're talking about an MVP pipeline, you're, that's sort of ground zero. That's, that's, the, that's the foundation of your house is what you're going to do there. Now, if you go to the next one, so it's within this, once you get the code written, you need to build it. You have to be able to generate that code, compile it, um, build is the typical term that they use in DevOps and that, that can refer to all of the above, but it's between these two boxes and between these two arrows is where, like I said, the engineer is going to spend the vast majority of their time iterating through that code. I make a change, I build, I test, I build it, I test it. I make a change, I build it, I test it. I make a change, I build it, I test it. I scan it to make sure that it's, it's meeting all the standards that I have before I check that in, before I push that down the pipeline. That's where it's going to go. So I, when getting this part of the pipeline right and getting this part of the pipeline as smooth as possible for the engineer is key to having a really nice pipeline and having that, that base for what you want. If you go to the next one, so deploy. So once you're done iterating locally through your changes and you've run your unit tests or hopefully you've run your unit tests, it's at that point you want to deploy your you want to deploy your binary to your uh, to your to your platform, to your to your infrastructure, and that's where within this pipeline, once you're done and you've checked that change in, that change get pushed down the pipeline and you deploy it onto your dev system, your test system, uh, maybe even your pre prod system, depending on your process. All those pieces are this is what what my boss used to call table stakes. They're the things that need to be there to have an automated pipeline. And hopefully everyone on the call and everyone that I'm talking to, this, this, is, this is the foundation that you're building. So your engineer is going to keep going through your, through your coding and your building and doing that, you know, iterating through that change. And then once it's ready, it's going to push down the pipeline and ultimately you're going to deploy it to your infrastructure. And then if you go to the next one, Terry, that's when you're going to call your automated testing. Now, how good or bad or, or, or what you do in your pipeline is really going to be dependent on your automated testing. All of these pieces are essential to, uh, to a good pipeline. But testing is probably the, the, the pillar that holds most of the weight. This is your load-bearing wall, if you will. You're only good, your pipeline is only going to be as good as your automated testing, and it's only going to be as fast as how fast you can go while you're testing. So everything that you've done up to this point is leading into testing, and it's leading into how automated your testing is. And there's a lot of different tools that you can use for that. BMC provides you with, with several tools to do functional and regression testing, as well as there are third-party tools or open source tools that you can use, like Selenium, for doing that testing. But as you push down this pipeline, this is, your, this is your foundation. Go ahead and go to the next one, Terry, if you don't mind. The last but not least is you need automation. The, the, one of the, the last component, maybe uh, it's last but not least, is, is you need orchestration automation. You need a tool that can plug into your system and push these 
push your code, push your change down this pipeline. This is, this is the tool that actually automates the pipeline. Each one of these is just a step or a task. It's within GitHub Actions or Jenkins or uh, Digital AI's Excel release or, 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 and cl or CloudBees, you know, CloudBees, Jenkins. Each one of them, they're the ones that are defining those tasks and what happens at build, what happens at deploy, what happens at test. It's automating that is what gets your pipeline to become an actual pipeline, an actual conveyor belt. You want to be like, uh, like Ford. You want to create that conveyor belt, right? That will automate all those tasks and push it down the pipe so that at the end, you have that built product that you can deploy. But this is, this is an MVP. This is what you need at a minimum to have a good pipeline. But I think the next question or, or what comes up, if you go to the next one, Terry, is what happens when you want to do a great pipeline? Do we have any questions, Terry? Well, I just want to I go, go back and, and I can ask it on this slide as much as the other is that, you know, on the, I'm going to be a broken record here. On these slides, we show um, specific tools, but you may have others. I know I specifically have a client that uses bamboo. Um, so just know that these are examples, you know, your pipeline will be based on the tools that are in your toolkit. Um, and also some stages, and, you know, we didn't talk about this, um, Tony, when we were prepping for this meeting, but, you know, this can be an iterative. You could have test deploy, test deploy. So, you know, as he said, this is just a component set for, for a good pipeline. So then how do I go from good to great? Well, first off, to talk about your your client with bamboo, they to your that's a that's a perfect um, that's a perfect example of you can use what tools your organization finds best. What we have here is a set of tools. This is a basic set of tools that we put out, but this is an example. This is not the like I said. This is not the universe of everything. If you're using bamboo and you're using bamboo as an orchestrator, you can plug that in. Because our tooling, especially ISPW, is built with this open borders policy, as long as you can call an API, you can do each one of these tasks and you can use anything you want as an orchestrator. These are just the ones that we have at a flush. These are the logos that we put in here at a flush, but you can plug in anything. Now, what we want to talk about, though, to, to Terry's point is you have a good pipeline. And I'm hoping that everybody on this call is following the same methodology and following those, those same practices that I just talked about. It, it, and of course, at varying levels. Like I said, there is no one size fits all. Everything, there's, there's variability in everything. But how do I make a great pipeline? I already have a set of pipelines and they're good. They, everyone uses them and, and we like them. But how do I make them great? How do I make those pipelines great? Well, there's a few things that you need to do. The first thing is measurement, metrics. Measure, measure, measure. You can't, my, I, my old boss, the same one who used to call things table stakes, he had another saying, and that was, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. You have to be able to measure quality, uh, velocity, frequency, adoption, you have to look at all those metrics and constantly be measuring, how am I doing? How fast am I? What am I trying to do? Do I have bottlenecks? Am I seeing bottlenecks? Can I make this more efficient? A really good example of that are the DORA4 metrics. So DORA is a, is a DevOps, I can't remember what DORA stands for off the top of my head, but it's a set of metrics or, or a, a group of companies got together led by Google and put together a set of metrics that you should, that from a DevOps point of view, that you should, you should measure constantly. And the DORA4 are deployment frequency, lead time for changes, mean time to recovery, and change failure rate. All those things should be measured constantly in your pipeline and you should be having reports and you're looking at those all the time. Now, a great tool for that is Z Advisor. 
So the advisor comes free with anyone who has the CompuWare tooling and or the BMC CompuWare tooling. And what it does is it takes all those metrics, all those pieces that are in your, 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 your mainframe and on, in your DevOps pipeline, and it pushes them into a set of pushes them into a set of uh, dashboards that you can use for measuring all those different pieces and all those different things that you want to measure. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think we have an example of that. Yeah, um, thanks, Tony. So I don't want to steal the thunder of um, a few of my peers that will be doing a much deeper dive on the advisor. But what I thought important um, to share is that the MC CompuWare, we took a baseline. I mean, that when you measure, you have to have that baseline. And our first baseline was that only 36% of our developers' time was on innovation, which meant that over 66% was on bugs. And it was taking us an average of 74.3 days um, for mean time to resolution. You know, we went from waterfall to agile to automated testing to pipeline. And you can see that over the years, our innovation improved. You know, we went from, you know, um, 36% innovation to 88. And we went from 74 to 20 in our MTTR. So it goes to, you have to create that baseline and then every year or, or every six months, whatever works, you know, for your shop, you ha have to compare. Um, some in, de uh, in uh, the advisor, these are just some of the KPIs, you know, backlog time, number of new elements deployed, mean time to resolution, mean time to detect. Um, these are what we started with. Um, we may change, we'll add some, we may drop some, we'll find they're not um, relevant to what we're trying to um, communicate. Again, not gonna go deep, deep dive in here, but here's just a sample of what a product productivity dashboard would look like. And these are KPIs showing where are your components spending most of their time during the life cycle. So, you know, on average, you have a component that's say, spending 21 days in the life cycle. Um, and subsequent screens, you would see that, you know, two of them were in development and 18 of them were in, in testing. So now you can start seeing where your bottlenecks are and adjust and measure. And you'll see, you know, changes over time. Um, this is an intuitive DevOps dashboard and it is um, just, it's issues. You know, um, what is the mean time to resolution and percent of issues that are open versus closed. Um, and then last but not least is our benchmark. And we're continually, constantly um, adding more to these and, and tweaking them. But this is where you'll see your mean time to resolution, your average cycle time, your, your testing time. And these gauges are red, green, and yellow. And you want to see your stuff in green and not red and yellow. You want to drop your mean um, MTTR and you want to decrease your average life cycle. And um, you, know, you might want to increase your testing time. It depends. Um, you know, if you, know, you want to spend more time in testing than in development, that, that again, it's got to be shop. Um, decision. Um, but what's important is that you can see over time how you're doing. So going back to what Anthony said, it's all about setting baselines, measure, measure, measure. So Anthony, I'm going to throw it back over to you. Um, and we left off with the MC Computer as the advisor. And then next is, um, I believe, integrations. Yeah, go ahead and hit the next one too. So as, as you guys saw, Z Advisor is a very powerful tool. So if you're going to hit, if you're going to, to, to make this good pipeline great, you absolutely positively need to measure. And if you're, if you're not plugged into Z Advisor today, you should be plugged into it tomorrow because that's what's going to take your pipeline to that next level so that you can see where you need to go. Like, how do you need to tune and tweak this? I think the next thing, if you're going to make a good pipeline great, you need to address security and security operations. In order to bring your pipeline to the next level, you have to look at security operations. Now, security operations grew out of the, 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 the thought or the, the recognition that organizations are not within their DevOps pipelines are not satisfying security requirements. 
So what typically happens is you have, in order to push anything to production or pre-prod or, or even sometimes into your infrastructure, you have to validate and security scan that code, those changes that are going in. And before this, a lot of times that was a manual step. That was, so you've got everything ready, you've got everything um, created and you're ready to go. And now right before production, you need to send your, you need to send your change off to security in order to scan it, to validate it, to make sure that everything is good. And sometimes that would come back and it would be, it would be wrong. You would have a security violation. Now you've gone all the way down your pipeline. You've done umpteen number of tests to find out that there's something wrong and you have to take it back to the beginning and change it or, or, or mitigate that security, that security issue. Now that's a, that's a huge dissatisfier to your testers, to your engineers, to everyone. Now with integrating security into your pipeline, you can shift that as far left as you want. And it takes that from being a manual task to now being a part of your DevOps pipeline. In order to have a great pipeline, you, have, you must be able to securely push your code down the pipeline into your various levels and into production. Validating your artifacts, making sure that the same artifact that is being deployed was the one that was built. Um, security scanning your code to make sure you're not adding any more vulnerabilities into your, into your infrastructure and system. These don't have to be problems. These don't have to be uh, hiccups in your pipeline. These can be things that you automate and you build directly into your pipeline. It's going to make for a more secure organization. It's definitely going to make your security team happy. And it's going to relieve everyone's worries in today's day and age when security is on the front of mind for everyone. Building this into your pipeline is essential. One other thing, <clears throat> the next thing that you need to go to, if you take a look over on the right-hand side, ServiceNow, BMC Helix, you have to build change management into your pipeline. Just like security, before you can push anything down into pre-prod or production for most organizations, you have to put in a change ticket, uh, an RFC if you're from the ServiceNow world or whatever the equivalent that is in a BMC Helix. You have to put in those change tickets. You have to track that. Typically, that's where security and or uh, your, your uh, systems, uh, systems programmers, uh, your, uh, your network team, all those teams have a chance to review your, review your code, review your change, and make sure that it's good. And a lot of times, I know at my former place, this was at least an hour's worth of work every sprint for somebody, for the release manager, to create that ticket, to push it down, trigger the workflow in, inside of ServiceNow, and then watch that ticket go through and then validate that it was approved. All that can be automated. Your pipeline should handle that seamlessly for your engineers and for your release managers. And again, that will be a giant satisfier when you roll out these pipelines. Automating those, those little tasks, those, those I'm not going to call them annoyances because they're essential, but automating those things, those are what make a good pipeline great to keep hammering that same message over and over and over again. The last thing you need to do to make a good pipeline great is you need to build in operations. One half of DevOps is operations and you need that observability built in throughout the entire life cycle of your, of your change, the entire life cycle of your pipeline. All those pieces need to be built in there. Amy Ops, Amy Ops Insights, all those, all those metrics that operations needs to collect and review and monitor, those things need to be built into your pipeline at the very, very, very beginning. And that's also will make your good pipeline great. Having operations be able to review the baseline of your change as it goes down the system and then goes into production so that they can look out for any, any slowdowns, any alerts, any errors, anything in the logs that maybe they need to uh, they need to action. 
that kind of automation and those kind of uh, those kinds of pieces are essential to making a good pipeline great. And BMC offers a number of different tools to do this. They offer a number of different tools that will provide you those insights, as well as there's a lot of third-party integrations with things like AppDynamics and Dynatrace that you can plug in. But whatever you plug in, you have to make sure that your pipeline is pushing that data and all that monitoring is built in from the very beginning. So that when this goes into production, your operations guys are set up and armed and ready for any issues that may come. Now, if you've done your job right, let me say that a different way. If, you, if the pipeline is built right, you should have detected any of that stuff before you got here. But we all know once you go to production, that's actually when reality hits and operations needs to be able to monitor and see those changes. And that should feed back into your pipelines. So to make a good pipeline great, you have to plug into monitoring. Monitoring needs to be one of the baselines of everything that you do here. So I think if you take those steps, you could take your pipelines to the next level. Metrics, measuring, security, automating change management and those little tasks that you have to do to be compliant with your process. And then finally monitoring. If you add all these things into your pipeline and you make them a part of the pipelines that you're offering up to your different teams, then you're not gonna have good pipelines. You're gonna have great pipelines. If you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Terry. Yeah, and I'm off mute. Um, Tony, thank you so much for what you've shared. Um, some on the call know, some may not know, but T Tony actually is not just talking the talk, he walked the talk, walked the walk. He um, implemented in a, the company he came from um, a lot of automation and DevOps. So he's a phenomenal resource to talk to, to understand how to do this. So next is, as we wrap up today, is next steps. Um, obviously, uh, there's a lot of research you can do, but um, at the devops.api.bmc.com, you can find out more information on DevOps. If you want to engage us, if you want to engage Tony directly with your company or others in our um, organization, Stuart S. B. Um, at all, um, just reach out to your TAM or your PAM or an account rep or even whoever sent you the invitation to this. Um, and we'll work with you. Um, to schedule a deeper dive into your pipeline and your processes. Um, and also there are some links for other webinars and podcasts that we have done in the past. Um, but engagement is important. Um, what's coming up next, we're gonna wrap up today is uh, our next session is let's cut to the chase, how to find and resolve issues faster. Um, and that's using Amy Ops. So now we're starting to get into the actual tools or components um, within your pipelines. Um, but it's how Amy Ops can show you how to reduce your MTTD, MTTR, and MTDF while maximizing accuracy and minimizing your false positives. And then um, our May webinar will ignite your DevOps journey with the BMC DevOps workshop. And that's where you would work with individuals from BMC to through um, value stream mapping or just discussion, trying to identify what tools are in your shop, um, it, you know, what your next steps would be in starting your DevOps journey. I'd like to- Hey, turn Terry, to there's, there's a couple of questions too, before we, before we, we close out, there were a yep. couple of questions in the q and I'd, I'd like yep. to answer if we can. Yep, that was going to be next, Tony. Oh, sorry. Say. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. uh, sorry about that, Terry. I'm jumping. Yeah. I'm so excited. I'm jumping the gun here. You know, you're good. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Ward. Um, um, and he's going to ask you the questions that have to be asked. All right, great. Well, well first of all, thanks so much. And before we go any further, I'd like to thank uh, Terry and Tony for a job well done. Also, uh, you know, everyone on the line, uh, I'd like to encourage you to reach out for additional resources. Uh, if you'd like copies of the tool chain documents or slides, either pre-populated or blank, both, or even the pipeline uh, slides that were referenced, please ask for those. 
Uh, also, uh, you know, any additional information regarding Z Advisor and uh, the DevOps workshops, which uh, at my sense that Tony's kind of chomping at the bit to, to speak to here here in a moment. Uh, you know, please ask for resources. We are here to help and are eager to do that. Uh, we encourage you to contact your uh, BMC account manager or technical account consultant, or if you're unsure of who to contact, just uh, reach out to Terry or I, and uh, we'll get you in the right direction. Um, but first, let's move on to the questions. And, and Tony, I, I think I'll start with the one that uh, you, 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 the, the, what Cart's getting ahead of the horse on. Uh, so, uh, you know, someone on the call asked, uh, this whole pipeline build looks like a lot of work for mainframe shops to go to the next level and to automate. Do you offer small step or do you provide recommendations on small steps to be taken? Uh, is this an iterative process or agile all the way? Thanks in advance. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. I think Vivek is the guy who answered it. I'm looking at the at the Q and A while I'm while I'm sitting here, and absolutely yes. So so when I'm talking about the pipeline, I'm talking about the whole enchilada to to the point you're making. But this is absolutely an iterative process. You're not going to put all this in place in a couple of days and poof, magically everything's automated, everything's working. This is an iterative process that you add a piece at a time. And you go, that's why you have to get that good pipeline. Then you start working on the great pipeline. Now, if you can build it and, and, and do all the pieces all at once, absolutely. But it is definitely an iterative process and something. And a lot of people I see when they, when they go down this route, they start off small. They take a single thing and they automate it. They take a single, um, they take a single app team or a single use case or something like that. And they automate that and they iron it out and they make sure everything's good. And then they use that as a template for the next one and the next one and the next one, right? So, so you absolutely hit the nail on the head. This is an iterative process and we absolutely can walk you through what are the small steps? What are the first things that you should be looking at and getting that going? And a lot of organizations start out, they create these pipelines and they put manual checkpoints in them. And that's not a bad thing. You want to you want to make sure you have everything white. It, it's hard to go from waterfall to 100. percent I'm going to push code into production anytime, anywhere, any place, and all this is automated. You want to have those those checkpoints to make sure everything's good, and then you'll see over time they're really not necessary anymore. You've got this down to a process, and once you have that process down and it's repeatable and it's just the same thing over and over and over again, you don't necessarily need to have those in there. So, and then this goes back also to reaching out to us. We can come in, myself or Stuart Ashby or Atul Bovan, you know, any of the, any of the uh, DevOps architects that we have here, we can come out to your company and we can do a, what we call a discovery session or an assessment. And I think that's the workshop that's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. So I'm not going to go too far down into it, but we'll look at how you operate today and sort of provide you with that, that roadmap of the steps you can do iteratively to get to that great pipeline. And like I said, a great pipeline doesn't happen overnight. It takes work and dedication, but once you get there, it's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Thanks, Tony. Um, Moving on to the next qu question here, um, is ISPW DB2, let me start over, in ISPW, are DB2 stored procedures and COBOL programs stored in the pipeline or supported in the pipeline, excuse me? Yeah, ab I mean, the pipeline can be anything you want. So absolutely. I mean, this is the, the pipeline I'm talking about here is for um, is for, for, for pushing mainframe loads. So anything you can do on a mainframe with an ISPW, is supported in the pipeline. And that includes DB2 stored procedures. Besides automating it through the pipeline, there's a tool that BMC uses called DB2 for DevOps. That is absolutely awesome, which will provide you not only that automation to push your DB2 stored procedures, but will you allow you to scan them and validate them before you push them out. Um, there's a lot of information on that if you go out to the BMC website. And, and, and if you have questions on that, re please reach out to someone and we'll be happy to talk through that. But anything you can do, you can do, you can, is supported in the pipeline. The question you need to ask yourself is not why, 
the question is why not? Why can't I do that? Why can't I support DB2 stored procedures? Why can't I automate my DB2 schema updates? Why can't I automate this task? Why can't I push this code down a pipeline? Why does it need to be manual? Why do I have to have somebody? Those are the kind of questions you'll, you'll, you'll annoy some people with that, but at the same time, it, it's what drives this forward. So remember the question isn't why, it's why not? Why shouldn't I do that? Good input. A um, couple more questions here. How flexible does a pipeline need to be? How often should you change the process? I think that that's really dependent on the organization and what you're trying to what you're trying to accomplish. Your pipeline needs to be flexible enough to allow for teams to go in and make those adjustments they need to optimize the pipeline for them, for their process, for their technology stack, but keep them within those guardrails. Keep them within that channel that you've set up. So it's not a, it's not a you know, two plus two equals four or 42. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it needs to have, it's a, it's a, it's, I guess it's an art more than a science. It, it needs to be flexible enough to allow for innovation and automation within the pipeline while still maintaining security, uh, change management, all those guardrails that you want to put in process wise. So, Tony, I'm going to hop in here and just give my you know, kind of insights or whatever you want to call Absolutely, it. Absolutely, Terry. I think this goes back to the measure also. If you implement a pipeline and you measure and you're not seeing the results you need, then it's agile and you have to, you know, tweak it and then remeasure. So it goes back to the measure. Um, we'll tell you if that pipeline's working or not working, or if you have to make adjustments to the pipeline. Just my thoughts. That's a great point, Terry. The other thing too is, you know, you need to look at these as a set of templates. So as you make adjustments, you, you adjust your pipeline as needed. And as you make those adjustments, you provide that as a template for the next one. So a team comes in and they get a templated pipeline. They get that base pipeline. And then, like I said, they have some flexibility within that to make modifications as they need. So Ward, is there any more questions? I see, see another one fell in there. Um, yeah, the, the, there are. I'm trying to be mindful of time at the same time, but a lot of good questions here. Uh, let me we've go ahead got and ask 15 this one. minutes. So, okay. uh, you know, yep. Yeah, let me, let me go ahead and ask this one that just, 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 just came in, and you know who you are. So, uh, good, good question here. Um, it was mentioned earlier that quality and speed of the pipeline hinges on automated testing. Does this mean regression testing, uh, unit testing also need to be maintained as an application changes or does it need to be man maintained as application changes happen? How does maintaining and improving test cases fit into automation pipelines for application changes? That's a great question, Kevin. And that's a, I would almost say that's a statement. The answer to that is yes. As you are going through and you are pushing changes down your pipeline, at the same time your, your engineers are coding your change, your testers should be creating regression test scripts, uh, unit tests, all of that, right? You should be defined, I mean, in, in, in a perfect world, depending on what your methodology is, you should be writing your unit test before you even write your changes as an engineer. Then as you're going down, your testers need to be adding those automated test cases to the system to catch those, uh, to, to catch those changes as they go. So this all needs to be going on at the same time. Now, if you, if you have your tests plugged into your, autom to your pipeline, then all you're really doing, just like any engineer, you're writing your new test case, you're checking that in, and then that will get called as part of your regression suite when you go down the pipeline. So it absolutely needs to be a part of your automation pipeline and part of your application changes as they go through. They should be in parallel. And in, in some ways, writing those tests and regression cases is just as difficult, just as much work as writing 
the test, uh, excuse me, is writing the change or writing the, the business case itself. But the payoff for that is huge. It is work, but the payoff for that is gigantic down the line in quality and in velocity. So, Tony, on a few screens ago, um, there was this area that talked about scanning. Um, and with testing, automated testing, I think it's really important to have the code coverage component of also. So you're verifying not only what you, you've tested all the changes, but that you have tested. I mean, I could have a hundred cases, but if it's not hitting my lines of code that changed or I'm hitting 80% of the code that wasn't touched, um, you're open to, to having issues with you know, your new code. So we didn't hit it on this session. We will hit on it in another one, but code coverage using Sonar Cube and other tools to validate how much of your code you've actually executed. Yeah, and that's built into Topaz Workbench too, by the way, the code coverage metrics, as well as Sonar Cube. Yeah, I, I, so I left that off on purpose, and I should have mentioned this earlier. So there'll be another session specifically about scanning code coverage and all that, but absolutely you need to see, you need to see how much of your code is being tested so that you can measure, uh, going back to measurement, so you can measure how good your testing is from a, from a code coverage point of view. And you need to, those are essential metrics for the quality of your, of your code and for, for your sanity as you're pushing these code, as you're pushing this code down the pipeline into production, right? So more to come on that. I, I, that that's such a big and important topic. I didn't want to gloss over it and put it into the hole. I think that's something that we need to we need to deep dive down into and really talk through. Absolutely agree, um, Ward. Before you do your housekeeping, I think we're going to wrap it up now. Um, but hold on, but, real quick. Uh, I, I am watching the clock, but uh, uh, another question came in that the hinges or attaches so so nicely to the last couple that were asked. I want to see if we could go ahead and squeeze it in real quick. Absolutely. Tony, we got the question uh, and I think we know the answer, but I want to go ahead and raise it anyway, because it, because it was asked and I think it's so apt to what you were just speaking to. It says, can you have a pipeline trigger another pipeline based on some factor? Oh yes, absolutely. So you can have a pipeline trigger another pipeline. So if you, if you, each one of those steps in your pipeline is a task and within that, Within those tasks, you can trigger another pipeline. It can be a different tool that triggers a pipeline within that tool, or it can be uh, another pipeline. Let's say you're using digital AI. You can trigger a pipeline from a pipeline. That absolutely can, can happen and is actually a, uh, a fairly normal practice depending on what you're trying to do. And the nirvana of all this, if you wanna make a great pipeline perfect in my mind, it's when you tie distributed and mainframe loads together into a single push. And that's the kind of thing, again, that's probably a whole nother session, but that's, that's where I think ultimately all this is going from a DevOps point of view. The ability for, you have a cross-functional project that has uh, cloud, mobile, web, um, mainframe, all those components, and you have a set of pipelines for each, and then you're using a sort of in a, an Uber pipeline that triggers all that and pushes them together. That's where I think all of this is going. And I, it, I get, I get jazzed up just thinking about it, talking about it, Ward. Uh, me too. And I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so Terry, I know there's a couple other things you wanted to mention and yep. you just had some health house things that I can hold off to the end. So why don't you talk about, talk to us about the ideas portal at our page, as well as how to uh, join the, the BMC uh, mainstream in the mainframe community. Well, you've taken a little bit of the wind out of my sail right there, but thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that we have a um, an ideas, um, whatever environment. It's off the BMC uh, community page. So you would click into BMC community, then you would go to whatever product you wanted to submit an idea for, and then there's an idea tab and you can submit an idea. You can um, submit ideas uh, it's important that you vote on ideas because the higher the vote count, the more likely development and our, um, is going to look at it. 
And I just threw a few up there, you know, that are already out there allowing code coverage for background CICS programs and creating APIs to trigger our own plugins from Topaz. So as you, as you go down this DevOps journey, if there is any integrations that you think would be you know, useful, if there was any other um, changes to programs or tools that would be beneficial, please go out to the BMC community, uh, create a new idea. Um, every month we're gonna promote different ones um, at the end of these sessions. So you'll see what other people are putting up there. But remember voting is important. Um, last, I'm just gonna wrap up with is we have a main, streaming the mainframe user community. And if you're interested in signing up, uh, joining that community, just let us know. So Ward, I'm gonna hand it back to you so you can do the wrap up and then we are done. All right, well, thank you again. Uh, if everybody has hung, hung with us almost the, 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 the full hour and uh, the, the Terry and Tony again, uh, let me also uh, just uh, encourage you to go ahead and register for the uh, uh, upcoming uh, webinars that have already been announced for April and May. You know, let's cut to the chase, how to find and resolve issues faster. That'll be on April 21st. And then in May, uh, ignite your DevOps journey with BMC DevOps workshops. That'll be on May 19th. Now, I know we mentioned those in the February session as well as uh, uh, some today, but uh, something that uh, I, I don't think has come through loud and clear in either one of those uh, shout outs regarding the workshops is they are included with maintenance as a, uh, for no additional fee. So that's a huge value add that's uh, included with your license agreement with BMC. So to have a SME come in and uh, you know help you develop pipelines and tool chains and, and uh, make recommendations on where to start and how to improve uh, um, you know, velocity, quality, and efficiency, uh, I think it's a huge value add. So just a quick shout out on, on the workshops. Uh, also, you know, if by chance you do have a conflict, I know we're all busy and you can't attend the live event, we encourage you to go ahead and register uh, anyway. Uh, uh, this will ensure that you'll automatically get a good recording and any uh, resources that are shared during the, uh, the, the, the live webinar. And then lastly, uh, please don't forget to take that survey. Again, it's only like four questions and should pop up automatically. So thank you again, everyone, for your time and we look forward to seeing you next month. Take care, everybody.